We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're on episode 147 now. And what we're going to be talking about in this one is taking new routes in therapy. Mm. So I'm going to say the wonderful Jackie Jones, because I know you've <laughs> played to me so many times. So I, but I did start, I did pick this title. I picked most of them. I think I took all of them. You pick all the titles, Bob. Uh, there's two parts to this, or there's two ways of looking this 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 title. One of the one of them is about, you know, changing tack, changing direction, changing roots in the psychotherapy process. The other thing we also could talk about in the podcast is the different routes people take when they train as psychotherapists and counseling because there's many different routes. Yes. And I th- when I thought of this title, it was much more about, you know, taking different routes in the th- therapy process. But today, when I was thinking about what I'm going to talk about, I was thinking a lot of people listening to us are counsellors and therapists might be interested about, and people interested in the world of psychotherapy and counselling and how to move from one world to the other or to how to start might be interested in the different routes uh people go in the world of counseling and psychotherapy but i'd like to start with my first thought about this title which is different routes in the therapy journey people take yeah is that okay absolutely i i completely agree and i think both topics are very worthy of a podcast but just just yeah time to get to both but we'll start with the first okay so there's a wonderful poem in a wonderful book and the book is ta today by ian stewart and van joins done many editions of it i forget when it was first written i think it was 1987 but you don't have to buy the first edition i think the last edition god knows when um in the back of that book is a basic TA textbook. It's a wonderful poem, and you'll know it, Jackie, by Nelson Porsche, I think, which talks about if you go down one route in a script way, you might just fall in a hole, and it takes a long time to get out of it. And then the next, I think there's five chapters to it. So the best thing to do when you get out of the hole is to go down another route in attempt to change. But the f- problem is you still go down the same bloody route and you still fall down the same hole. And it, I think the five chapters lead to, and you might, perhaps you can tell me the different chapters, Jackie, but I know the last one is you, you help the client go down a different road altogether. Or you, get, or, you, or you help the client um get out of the hole quicker yes um and take a different route and why i've gone to this poem is as a therapist you might start off one way and you might actually find you have to go down another route so it reminded me of that poem which you're probably looking up now i've got it here shall i read it yes yes go on it's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters by Portia Nelson. Oh, Portia Nelson, that one. Yes. And chapter one, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. 
chapter four, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. And then chapter five, I walk down another street. Yes. I think that it gets me every time I read that. I think it's such a lovely poem. I really do. It's such a lovely poem. And it is, I wanted to start the podcast that way because we are talking about roots. Yeah. And how, and if you think about it in that way, it's like you could say the whole of the therapy process with the client begins and ends with this. In other words, helping the client be aware of the destructive route they're on. Yes. And helping them find a different route. Yeah. Healthy one. Yeah, absolutely. And being along the journey with them. (laughs) Yeah. As a witness. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. You can look at therapy that way. And even you can look at it. And even as we look at it that way, which I think is a wonderful way to look at it. I'm very touched by the poem. However, clients from their unaware places will set so many traps and so many pitfalls. Sometimes it takes a lot of perseverance, quite a long time, to stay with the client so you can help the client be more aware and help them make changes and integrate different routes into their life. Mm. It's more beneficial. Yeah, Not a straightforward process usually. Absolutely not. Because every time they become aware of their behaviour and they change, there's always the opportunity for self-sabotage. Well, so think- it's not it's not a straightforward process. It's not it's never a linear process. No, I think to help people find more healthy routes to change. Yeah. It's never linear. Because if they could do that, they would never come to therapy in the first place. No, absolutely. So the therapist has to help them be aware of what's happening on this route. The pitfalls that might happen. And just like the poem, really, that we the you read out cell open. Yeah. Um help them find a new route so they can take charge and ownership of their own destiny. Yeah. And that's the that's the big thing in therapy, isn't it? Is that they can take charge of their own destiny. Oh, oh. Absolutely. And it's not us that does it to them. No, but it is they, us. Yeah, you're correct. We don't do that. We don't do it to them or we don't. If we just said, well, this is the route, this is the map, this is how you get there, goodbye. Yeah. We'd probably repeat history with them. Which, to be fair, some of us would have liked that in our therapy process, Bob, I can remember. (laughs) Wanting that desperately when I was going through my own personal therapy. is, You know, if you know what I need to do, just tell me and I'll do it. But that's not how it works. No, you know, and I was thinking my childhood when you said that, which wasn't a very pleasant one, but or stroke and it wouldn't be so much for me that I got a map of a healthy route. It would be the most important thing for me, and I'm not sure looking back, this is true, but anyway, this is what I feel, is that I had somebody to accompany me in the uh, route that the map went down. Yeah. So from a big part of therapy for me over many years was the that somebody accompany me um, and help me, if you like. I think a company is very important in the in the road or route of discovery and journey of uh, the healthy place I was going to. Absolutely, and it's having so that. Alone. Yeah, and it's having the trust in somebody for them to be there with you. That that's the. It's not just any Joe blogs on the journey with you. It's, there has to be yeah. a relationship. I was thinking of you. To, I was thinking of you as I was driving home to this podcast, uh, and there was a program on 
fostering. And I, and, uh, and I know you did that for a while, didn't you? Yep. I don't know if you still do that, but you did Not, that. yeah, 13 years. Yeah, and it had, I had on the sort of program, um, the radio station, I can't remember which radio station it was, but it had quite a few foster, people who did fostering and also people who had been fostered. And they were talking about, particularly the two people who had been fostered to talking about, and then they had the foster people. What was the most important thing, thing or quality? Uh, what was, yeah, as they were, as they were fostered. And um, one of the most important things they were talking about being fostered was number one, not being moved around or to different places. Mm. But secondly, really, somebody who spend time with them that would treat them uh with respect integrity and and be there in a secure safe way and being there was really central to them yeah so you know it more than perhaps most people i suspect absolutely the difficulty with that is for me is you know being there for them often involves having structure and boundaries that they butt against. It's definitely not an easy ride for either party. It's therapy though, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, I see you see, I see that what you're talking about as positivity in the ups and downs and potholes of the journey. Yeah. Because it provides a secure base and provides a a sense of safety in this journey which isn't always going to be so easy absolutely like yeah dead. yeah yeah and i think when it first happens when you know as a therapist or a foster carer or a parent or whatever when we need to put boundaries and structure in place they don't like it well adolescents never do do they no, I but if you, our clients, I presume they're going through the yeah, adolescent phase yeah, yeah. in the therapy room. They don't like it. If they're late and you end on time or, you know, what whatever it is, they, they're not 100% on board with it. By definition, that's why when we talk about roots in psychotherapy, it's about sometimes you need to, first of all, well, not sometimes, perhaps always, create the structure and safe place for the journey ahead. Yeah. Or the, the head. Otherwise, they may give up. Yeah. Or they may run away. Yeah. They may act out in ways where that route becomes impassable. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's, it's part of our job as a psychotherapist to... To be that safety net underneath them that you know and to have the belief in them that they can do this when they don't necessarily have that in themselves i agree completely i have a warning for everybody listening flashing lights warning <laughs> and it's about ego driven counselors or psychotherapists mm. they're so wedded to one route yes because they have read books or been trained or whatever it is so it's not this is not a criticism particularly it's just how i what i've observed over them let's get so wedded to a certain way of doing therapy or so wedded to doing a certain way of doing counseling or so wedded to a particular piece of theory they have this route so planned out mm. to an nth degree for their security and also what they think is best for the client but they never change it. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And that's my warning because that way of doing therapy, it, there might be success sometimes, but also can lead to huge problems. Mm. Yeah, I I'm think, I'm well, passionate about transactional analysis. You know me. I I love a diagram. I've always got my diagrams up, and I do have my go to things that I use, particularly in the early stages. Oh. But I'm open to anything. Literally, you know, the things that happen in my life will encourage me to research and to look at other avenues. And for me, the more I've got in my toolbox that can help my clients, the better. I agree. And I think the way forward 
And I'm not saying theory doesn't help you. I'm not saying treatment plans don't. I'm not saying books don't help you. I'm not saying many things. But what I am saying is, I think if you can listen to the client or help the client decode what they're trying to say to you, mm. and that will be the most effective route. Yeah. And that, that there's a definite skill in that, Bob, in decoding what they're trying to say or ask or develop with whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, because they might, from a sabotage place, uh, manipulate you from a psychoan psychoanalytical version and manipulate you to go down a route which will confirm the history. Yeah. So... I'm not saying that we just willy nilly follow the dictates of our clients. I'm more saying that if we stay attuned, use phenomenological inquiry, respect our clients, as well as looking at the defense processes, we can help them in a sharing and decoding, if you want to put that word into it. So between the two of you in a, in a, in a sort of co-created process, we'll find a way together. Yeah. And I like that. I like that co-creating and decoding because it is a partnership. We, we can't do it to them or at them. They've got to be an active participant in it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I was doing some thinking of supervision again, actually. Um, I was wondering a client that came, I was talking to her about the way forward with this client. And um, she was saying, well, you know, we have to go this way because the client wants us to go this way. Uh, and so I said, do you ever say no? <laughs> no. Is there a sense of bilateralism in the discourse with your client? In other words, just sharing some just sharing some other options that maybe we could go that way, we could go this way. So you have a co-created discussion because sometimes a client might not know about the stormy roads ahead mm. and may need you to give different options which may be more healthy. I think that's really important. Me too. And th I think there is a fine line. I I'm not sure whether it was this podcast or the one before that you touched on it about, you know, being an ego driven psychotherapist is not very good in it's, that yeah. I know better than you. But there is something in having the knowledge and being able to pass that on as options to the client. Yes. As long as that is done bilaterally. So yes. bilaterally and not unilaterally. Yes. Not the therapist sticking to a version. This is the only way. Yeah. This is the only way. I know that. You see, that sort of unilateral position can be taken as a monopolization of the truth rather than what I'm suggesting is a co created discussion where both partners take ownership of the road ahead. Yes, yeah. Definitely. You are correct in what you're saying, in a sense, because the therapist, in inverted commas, because if we look at transference and everything else, I'm not so sure, but we'll say in inverted commas, may have a more healthy script, then it is important for the therapist to point out options and healthy alternatives. But if the client is it like a parent-driven, you have to do it my way, then there can be a repeating of history. Yes. Yeah. So it's a balance. I understand that. Yeah. And it's not helpful either. It, it, you know, again, you know, going back to what we touched on before, if the, in my mind, if the client comes in and feels like they are in total control of everything in that room, that's quite an unsafe place for them to be. It's also an unreal position for them to be. Absolutely. They've had unreal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I often talk in the early days with clients about the OK Corral and I'm OK, you're OK. And, you know, it, it is that bilateral conversation that you have 
you know, mm. that we're both in an okay place. Mm. That's right. I, I like that uh, okay corral position. Absolutely. Different existential positions. Yeah. Most healthy being I'm okay, you're okay. And the most unhealthy position being I'm not okay, you're okay, you're not okay. Yep. The, yeah. The other two, I'm okay, you're not okay. And the other one being you're not okay, I'm okay. So I like that. And the way you're talking about the healthy routes ahead. Yeah. So I'm very I don't much... think there's anything wrong in, in using other modalities or things no. that you've learnt if, if you think that they are for the good of the client. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, yes, of course. That's where the whole birth of eclectic therapy came from. Uh, when I first came to therapy, that was a buzzword, eclectic psychotherapy. Nowadays, I think it's been substituted by integrative psychotherapy. Um, and part of integrative psychotherapy, the way it's used today, is exactly what you've just talked about, maybe a borrowing from different models um, if, it's, uh, you know, if, if it serves the client. Yeah. That's, that's the last bit is really important. Mm. It has to be done in the service of the client, not yeah. the service of the therapist. No, not using them as a guinea pig or just experimenting or doing, you know, something mm. for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. But I think sometimes to 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 mix things up is quite a positive thing in the therapy room. You know, I I felt stuck with some clients. I felt like. I don't know what to do because we've gone round in full circle about six times. We, you know, something needs to shift for us to move out of this. So I have introduced something different. Yeah, I think that's really good because, of course, it 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 it, it but may break that repetitive cycle. Yeah, which I know, you know, it's the the self sabotage and it's a protection and it's all that sort of stuff. But sometimes we need to shift the energy or whatever it is to to get out of that i used to do this a lot what you're talking about now i did a lot in <laughs> i can see you doing it a lot bob <laughs> many versions of experimentation yeah. over the years i remember once you might be appalled by this i don't know and podcast people might be appalled by this and i'm sure you might be shouting at the the mobile phone or whatever you listen to in a minute. But I, I remember with a client going through many of the repetitive behaviours you're talking about. Um, uh, I forget it, but it was particularly, if it was a repetitive process or a game about not being heard, and I wouldn't hear, hear them. But I, I, I can't quite remember if it was a repetitive behaviour of the person not talking, whatever it was. I decided anyway that I would get up and read the newspaper. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I got up and got the paper out and started reading that. And the person, she was so astounded, absolutely, that she started to rant and rave at me about this, that, the other. But it broke the repetitive cycle. Yeah. It, oh, it, it takes balls to be able to do that in the therapy room, Bob. I must admit, I don't think I've got I'm, I'm that. Well, yeah. big topic clients, so OCD clients, I used to do the therapy quite often, uh, lying down on a sofa. Yeah. Mainly because they didn't expect, mainly because they had a parent in their heads that said the therapist had to be perfect. I've I've done things on purpose to show that I'm not perfect. Absolutely, yes, I've, I've yeah, done that. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, there are many things from different models that many people might pick. The experimentation process of a lot of the gestalt techniques I've borrowed many times. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is I like to have a co-created process where it's all in service of the client and I at least have a thought process about what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. Not and again, I think it's getting a feel for the clients, you know, so some of my clients, I know that they would be open to trying new things where other clients, maybe not so. Mm. Do you know the, the best venue for experimentation? Group psychotherapy. Yes. 
I've never ventured into, I, I do couples, but couples are it. I've never done a group session in psychotherapy. I spent 35 years running psychotherapy groups, and they are the most wonderful venues for experimentation in a safe setting with eight people. Yeah. Contracted and everything else. Um, I was a great fan, and still am, of group psychotherapy. I'm also a great fan of new routes, like you know, changing routes if, if things aren't working, and finding together a new route. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like that poem that we read out at the beginning. Absolutely. You know, my my own life journey over recent years has led me to become more interested in in different options. I'm I'm interested in equine guided therapy now and I'm interested in the mind body connection. And th there's lots of things that I become interested in for my own benefit that I have no doubt will filter through into my private practice somehow. I think that's how it is. The more experienced we become as therapists, we often specialise in our own interests. Mm. Uh, those takes some different, may or may not take us different directions. And then there's life events that uh, also impact us. So we, you know, we may go down different directions as therapists, different routes as therapists, and that's all okay as well. Yeah. I think for me, transactional analysis will always be the bedrock of the grounding absolutely a hundred percent yeah yeah you know i'm the same and uh, I, I spent all my career with ta as you know the major grounding bedrock but i then i did then after i got the bedrock if you like go off and specialize in integrative psychotherapy and yeah but i'm very pleased that i got a founding bedrock system in place me which, too if you like yeah which became became a sort of guiding light, and therefore the other trainings that I, you know, took as I developed, I've used and they've been interesting and everything else. But it's been wonderful to have a structure to build all these different things on, if you like. Yeah, that's how I see it. I would, I, I, I don't won't ever move away from it. It will always be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed this podcast because it remind. I, I'm really pleased to be able to say that you know taking healthy routes, helping people find different routes, is one of the most important prerequisites, and the, and also journeys that the therapist and client take together. Yeah, absolutely. I've 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 really enjoyed this. Another one. Um, so what we're going to be talking about in the next one, um, the title that I've got down is The Pressure Cooker Effect in Therapy. And is that the 150th? That's <clears> 148. The pressure, and what's the 149 then, 150, if you've got them written down? 149 is five things I wished I had known before I became a psychotherapist. Oh, I remembered right. I remember thinking that one up. Oh, I remember <laughs> that part because I was the hundred and fiftieth. The growth of equine therapy. That's yours. I put That's that mine. because I know a little bit about it, but you're the expert in it. And I thought it was such an interesting development that you've taken in your career that I could not not have a podcast. You know, we have to have a podcast on that. Uh, how we've, we, we've given people a bit of a sneaky peek on what's coming up over the next month. Yeah, but but you know what? What a, that's wonderful. On the hundred fiftieth, we've got that. But the next one is the pressure cooker. Now, I spent a lot of my life as a therapist, carefully, meticulous, meticulously. It's that my dyslexia doesn't help me. Carefully, meticulously building up, very slowly, bit by bit, the pressure cooker. Oh, psychotherapy. <laughs> So I'm going to love talking about that. Um, just another thing to look forward to. Maybe I have been doing it and I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what this one's going to be about, Bob. You have. You have. So I look forward to that. Okie doke. Until next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.